taking your seats. We're going to get started with the second part of our programming. So pleased um, to have this economic development panel. Again, Mark Garber will be doing our moderation. And Agnes Palasa has had a, a scheduling conflict last minute, so she won't be joining us. But we're going to continue on with our program and expect a fabulous conversation nonetheless. So with that, I will turn it over, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much. So we have another great panel here. And uh, we're, we're short one person, but that's going to give the two folks that we have lots of time to, to enlighten us. And uh, so we're going to, I'm going to introduce each of these, and then we're going to go right into some questions. So I think many of you know Bill Wyatt. He's executive director of the Port of Portland since October of 2001. Prior to his appointment as the port's executive director, Bill served as chief of staff to Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber. It said former Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber in your bio, but I, I think he's come back and he's still uh, yeah. governor. But K Bill was with him for seven years. K-1 and K-2. <laughs> so um, he also spent six years as president of the Oregon Business Council and five years as executive director of the Association for Portland Progress. Bill also served as a state representative from the Astoria area from 1974 to 1977. The Port of Portland consists of four marine terminals, two general aviation airports, the Portland International Airport. The port has more than 700 employees and the annual operating revenues of approximately 260 million. The value of foreign trade moving through the port is $12 billion annually. For the, you know, the past several years, Bill has occupied his spare time by buying up all of the available industrial land in East Multnomah County. <laughs> The port now owns the Gresham Vista property and the Troutdale Reynolds Industrial Park, so we're pleased to have beer, Bill here today to tell us what he plans to do with all that land. Our other panelist is Janet Labar. She is president and CEO of Greater Portland, Inc., and that's the regional public-private partnership that helps companies expand or, re or relocate to the Portland-Vancouver metro area. Prior to this, Labar, or Janet, served as Chief Performance Officer of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, where she oversaw the organization's day-to-day -day operations and monitored GPEC's performance and execution relate, relative to its strategic initiatives and an annual goals. Janet worked closely with the Board of Directors to create fiscal year action plans and develop five-year strategic plans that guided the organization. Prior to joining GPEC in 2004, Janet managed the research and communications efforts at the Center for Workforce Development at the Mar Maricopa Community Colleges. Before this, she served as a research director for ABC affiliate WEAR-TV3 -E and sister station WFGX-IND in Florida. So you're another recovering journalist. <laughs> All right. So could we start? You know, we talk a lot about traded sector jobs and, and um, uh, maybe just even sort of explain what the term means and why is that important to the region and to East Multnomah County. And, and Janet, why don't we start with you? Sure. So I don't know if this is working. Everybody hear me okay? So traded sector jobs um, are associated with industries that uh, export or sell their goods and services outside of the region and internationally. Uh, and for East County and the region at large, this is, uh, manufacturing is our clear strength here. We've got a lot of the companies that do manufacturing represented here today. Um, but traded sector jobs are important because they bring outside investment in to the local economy. Uh, secondly, they pay higher wage jobs, and so that helps to stabilize your middle class. Uh, and thirdly, you know, through exporting activity, it really enables companies that are already here to grow and expand their jobs and their presence. Too high? Getting mic checked in the middle of my answer there. Um, really allows uh, companies that are already here to expand their footprint through export activity, so it allows them to grow and expand their, their jobs here. I believe that's a good explanation. Bill, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I think um, the way I always describe this is if we're not making something or producing something that we're selling to someone somewhere else, really, at the end of the day, we're just taking in each other's laundry. 
-hmm. And that is not a recipe for economic success. The only way to create wealth is to produce something and sell it to someone somewhere else. Uh, and that is, as much as anything, is the traded sector. Uh, we tend to think of the traded sector as being trade with foreign nations, and that's how the U.S. as a whole thinks about it. But for our region and for East County, it could be, you know, with our, our neighboring state to the south or to the east or to the, the north. Uh, we do, in this region, have a lot of foreign trade, which is terrific. But traded sector, in my opinion, also includes um, uh, other, uh, other regions and, uh, and other states. And uh, all of the data shows that jobs associated with that um, do pay more on average, significantly more. And so uh, that's why we tend to focus uh, more and more on uh, traded sector responsibilities. And, uh, you know, at the port, as a port, um, that really is kind of the role that we, we fulfill. So in attracting those important traded sector jobs, how important is workforce development uh, in that process? Um, if you could address that, and we, we'll start with Bill this time. Yeah, it's, uh, it's incredibly important, and I know you just had a panel on this, and it's one of the great conundrums, right? So, you know, when you've got high unemployment and the economy is kind of on its rear end, uh, people aren't investing and they're not developing, and so workforce development isn't all that important to employers because they're not hiring. Now all of a sudden, you know, we've got a six plus uh, unemployment level on a state or on a region wide basis, uh, and employers are dying because they cannot get uh, qualified employees. We have a real skills mismatch. Uh, and I hear about that all the time. I was uh, yesterday meeting with the Greenbrier companies who manufacture rail cars and, and so forth uh, with a, uh, one of our customers. And this is their biggest challenge, how to scale up during times when uh, business activity warrants it because they simply cannot get uh, sufficient skilled workforce. And at the same time, there is a, a reasonably high level of unemployment. And so. Workforce is critically important. It's a little different, I think, than many people imagine. Uh, people with, you know, skilled union electricians and pipe fitters and, uh, and so forth are really, really important. At the port, for example, 10% of our employees are union electricians, uh, which is amazing. And they're very good paying jobs. And these are people I would say uh, in our organization, the longest tenured employees tend to be people like electricians, uh, plumbers and pipe fitters, uh, laborers, et cetera. Uh, we own a pipeline dredge, uh, which helps maintain the navigation channel. We have employees there who have been with the port for over 30 years. Same job, same function, but these are terrific jobs uh, and make an enormous contribution to the economy, I might add. But uh, when I go to meet, I was out there the other day, you know, they all look like me. Uh, mm -hmm. Their hair is getting a little gray at the temples. Uh, they got to be careful about what they're trying to lift up. Uh, and I would say the same thing in the, um, uh, in the maintenance groups at the port. They're older uh, on average than our normal employees. And uh, that concerns me. And I think a lot of employers probably share that same concern. Janet, you, you're relatively new to the area, and you probably have some perspectives from other places you've been, but, but you know, how do you see that linkage between workforce development and attracting the right employers, and um, what, what maybe are some things that have happened in other regions that we can learn from? Sure. So, um, well, workforce development is a national issue, right? I mean, this is not something new that we are hearing about just today. Um, certainly in Phoenix, where I spent 12 years working in economic development there, similar issue, um, advanced industries, aerospace and defense, um, advanced manufacturing, all of those industries were aging, are aging. The utility companies are aging. So we also have a population here, north of 55, um, that will be you know, in retirement very, very soon. I think um, one of the stats that Andrew threw up there was that I don't know if it was 65% or 25%, but of the existing workforce that's eligible to retire um, are already working and they will be going into retirement age. So we have to look at 
the pipeline of the workforce that's coming up right after them. I think, um, again, the data that Andrew presented in terms of the diverse population that we are um, seeing shift rapidly and increasing here in, in the region uh, presents a, an immense challenge for workforce development agencies, for job training providers, for our higher education institutions, our community colleges, and it's important that we address access to those services for the entire spectrum of the population, and that includes ethnic diversity, uh, that includes um, mature and young adults, uh, veterans, disabled, uh, men and women. It's really important because self-sufficiency, as we all know, it starts with a job. So it's, it's critical to the economic development picture. So given that fact that it is critical, how can we in East Multnomah County demonstrate to uh, employers that we are a preferred location? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what are some of the things that we need to do? So one of the things that I think um, East County and the cities and Multnomah County at large are already doing is, is being, um, having this very conversation, having this dialogue. It's important to have honest conversations about your challenges as a region. And so Allison, you know, kudos to you for bringing this uh, to the forefront and, and having all of you in this room today to have a very difficult conversation. Um, one of the other things I think that the cities within East County are doing, they are already a strong partner within the regional model that is represented in Greater Portland, Inc. Um, and one thing that I'd like to kind of talk about uh, GPI's efforts to do, we've kicked off a Greater Portland 2020 plan. It's actually being led by um, my illustrious panelist uh, colleague here by Bill Wyatt and by Jim Pyro of PGE. And the plan itself, it's a five-year plan, so it'll get us to um, 2020, and it's intended to really unite all of those different elements of economic development um, that comprise our ecosystem here. So workforce development, uh, human capital, education, entrepreneurship and innovation, transportation and infrastructure, everything that you would think of economic development is going to be comprised into one single comprehensive regional plan that crosses the two states. It is seven county wide and is being led by our public and private leaders. Uh, we are fortunate to have Mayor Bemis on our steering committee in the city of Gresham. Um, thanks to Shannon uh, for her leadership on the technical advisory committee. And so one of the ways I think that East County can continue to showcase, its, its showcase itself as a preferred location is getting involved in the regional model and figuring out what are those trends that we are seeing at a regional level that can translate down to, um, to East County and its cities I also, I would like to, to I guess, acknowledge you know, the city of Gresham's great work in uh, streamlining some of their efficiencies. And so Mayor Bemis uh, mentioned it earlier, but cutting that time in half for industrial applications will be huge. It's huge for um, employers that are looking to come and do new business uh, within the city of Gresham. And it really signals a sign by local government that they are um, open, aggressive, and willing and proactive to be a, a good partner uh, within business. And then of course, and I'll let Bill speak more to this, but you know, the investments that are being made in TRIP and in Gresham Vista are um, again tremendous. I think those two areas, those two sites present incredible opportunity to be major employment corridors for uh, this, part of the, this part of the county. Bill? Yeah, so uh, a couple of thoughts. Number one, uh, your, your remarks uh, about us buying up all the spare industrial land in, uh, in East County uh, is, it was not an accident. Uh, you know, most of what we own is actually within the city of Portland. Uh, and there are limited opportunities for growth there. Um, and the city, I'll be blunt, is doing whatever they can to uh, limit those opportunities even further. Uh, and uh, <laughs> just saying, you know, uh, and our impression has been that, uh, in particular, the cities of Troutdale and Gresham, where we own property, uh, are really interested in developing um, their economic uh, aspirational future. And we want to do that with you. Mm -hmm. And we've got tools available to us to do that. The Troutdale Reynolds Industrial Project, I think, is the largest brownfield redevelopment project in the state right now. And uh, it was really hard. And uh, it took a long time. And every single party had their shoulder to the wheel, working very hard to make it happen. Well, you can imagine um, how that's going to work when you've got parties on the other side of the wheel pushing back 
and we don't experience that uh, out here. And it's been a great uh, partnership, a great relationship. When we meet with the city uh, of Gresham, as we do periodically at a, at a senior level, it's a team meeting. Uh, how can we move things uh, together? And I would say the same uh, for uh, Trout Tail. And I think that is an attitude uh, that is going to serve the region extremely well. Things never happen as quickly as you want them to, um, that's for sure. Uh, but um, we're here as, as partners. We're not uh, here to just uh, do whatever we want whenever we want because we can't. We need you to be our partners. And on the workforce uh, subject, let me just say this because uh, this is a, it is an immensely complex uh, challenge, I think. And my sense is the relationship here and in, frankly in other parts of the region between business and the community college uh, system is actually quite good. Um, I, I just see these interactions all over the place and just a very positive, uh, helpful uh, environment. I think there's a deeper challenge and I'm not sure that we're really uh, fundamentally addressing it and that is despite all of the evidence <clears throat> that there are good um, uh, blue collar uh, jobs available for people with the right kind of certifications and training. I think most kids today still get the message that if they want to be anything or do anything or go anywhere, they need a four-year degree. And uh, I think somehow or other, we have to find a way to change that message. And it's not a simple matter. It's not just mom and dad around the dinner table. It's not just you know the teachers or the, the schools. It is a real collective uh, effort. And if I had the answer to that, I would be first to, to share that with you. But I think a, a dealing with that message is going to be critically important to us because there are, I would say, a lot of those jobs available. They're not jobs that are going to be outsourced. You know, the union electricians mm -hmm. uh, at the airport who are installing airfield lights, uh, as an example, uh, that's not going to be outsourced. There's no way to do that. They're going to be here for a long, long time. And somewhere over the, the spread of time when so many uh, of these jobs uh, were outsourced. I think people just got this, oh, gee, that's, that's sort of not an area where I want to commit myself because I could lose my job. And the truth is jobs are changing. The economy is changing. And we have to, to create an environment where people are attracted to this kind of work. It's remunerative. It pays well. Uh, but also understand uh, no one's going to work in one place forever anymore. Those days are, are gone. You have to be comfortable uh, with adapting to a, a changing economy, and we have to support that somehow. So as the port has been marketing property in, in East Multnomah County, have you found that the workforce issues are a hindrance to, to um, you know, employers, potential employers? Well, you know, I'm looking out at my team here and they're all going like this, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. And I think that is not the biggest uh, challenge um, at the moment. The, you know, the evolution in the uh, economy of our region is always a, a little slower to react to uh, the economic cycles. And I'm not really entirely sure why that is, but I don't think workforce specifically uh, has been an issue for us in, uh, in marketing these properties. I mean, we have a lot of investment to make. We didn't just go out and buy any industrial property. We mm -hmm. bought industrial property that requires mm -hmm. a lot of effort. Uh, and so we're doing the, you know, making the advanced uh, investments in infrastructure, for example, without which you don't really have property to market. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's probably been our, um, our bigger challenge. And, you know, Troutdale Reynolds Industrial Project, we have neighbors, uh, you know, we have an airport. We own the airport, but we don't get to call all the shots. Uh, we have the Bonneville Power Administration right there. Uh, this was, you know, developed initially as, a, as an aluminum plant, and, uh, and it was for a long, long, long time. And so uh, kind of adapting to all of this is, um, uh, is a challenge, but we're getting there. Okay. You know, uh this would be for both of you, but but you talked about the, um, you know, uh, the jobs that, that don't necessarily require a four-year degree. So that it's sort of the middle 40 in the 40-40-20 plan, wouldn't, wouldn't you say, mm -hmm. and, and middle skill type jobs. You know, and, and traditionally, there have been a lot of people in East Multnomah County who have fit into that category. 
So what are some ways that you see, you know, employers, colleges, um, and, and Janet, maybe we start with you, um, uh, high schools, colleges, employers work together to, to, mm -hmm. to get to that 40, middle 40. Yeah. yeah, I think there were a lot of great examples that were mentioned in the prior panel um, that are occurring uh, between K through 12 and industry. And certainly I think it is not reliant upon just one of those parties to make the two-way connection happen. I think we all have to be willing and open to know that this is a collective challenge for us. It's also a huge opportunity because when you do peel away the in-migration of talent that is coming here and you look at what we are birthing and what we are growing here, um, you know, there's a huge opportunity for us to make sure that those people are skilled, come up the workforce pipeline, don't always get the four-year degrees or the two-year degrees. Um, you know, I was recently looking at, uh, I think it was the top 10 occupations list for the MSA, and I think Andrew again mentioned that there was only one of those top 10 that actually paid living wages, and if you are a mom with two kids, that's probably, being a registered nurse is maybe the only way that you're gonna be able to get by and be able to get food on the table for your children. So I do think, you know, I, I guess I can't answer it specifically only being on the ground here for three months, but um, the more that industry and education and job training providers, workforce development agencies, economic development organizations can have these conversations around how we do this together, uh, we'll get further faster. Um, and I, I will say that, uh, I'm not sure how or why, but um, I would like to spend more time with the workforce development agencies and people that are providing job training, uh, have more conversations with them. I had a, a great meeting with Andrew early on uh, in my arrival here and it really enlightened me and encouraged me that we've got um, a huge sense of data. We've got a huge sense of what it is we have to work with here from a workforce standpoint. But um, it may be a challenge to Dr. Durr, but I, I do think we need to get workforce development more at the table of, of economic development. And I do think this greater Portland 2020 effort is a way to do that. Okay. Bill? Yeah, I would say, you know, the, the middle 40 is probably the area that um, folks like you can have the biggest impact on. The upper 40, uh, to be honest, the, the four-year and postgraduate uh, folks, uh, many of them to begin with, are coming here from other places. And it's just the reality. And so uh, the middle 40 are people who live here. Mm -hmm. They're your sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. They're kids who are going to local uh, schools and who want to stay here if they can. Uh, and so it seems to me that's where all of us need to spend the most of our time and attention. We're doing great on uh, baristas uh, and, you know, uh, craft beer manufacturers. Uh, but that, that middle 40 people who require a certificate of some kind uh, in order to get into a, a career path is the area where all of us can have the greatest impact and where we need to spend our time. And I think. One of my concerns about workforce development is nobody is really owning at the moment, uh, from what I can see, uh, this, the, the need for a really deep, uh, important conversation around the culture of working uh, and why it's okay for a kid to go, you know what, I don't need to go to the University of Oregon. I'm a duck, I you know, love ducks. I don't need to go there in order to have a great life. Uh, I can have uh, all that I want. I can have a home, I can have a family, I can live here, uh, and I can go to Mount Hood Community College and get a certificate in uh, some industrial skill mm -hmm. and make it. Uh, and I think that's not a message that um, is somehow sinking through in many cases. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the workforce development community, they do good at what they're uh, d uh, assigned to do, their responsibility, but nobody seems to own, and I'm not sure where it belongs necessarily, but nobody seems to own the larger uh, dialogue, which I think is really uh, going to be very important. Okay. Both of you have such great regional perspectives about economic development, and, and so as you look at the um, assets that East Multnomah County has, which would include the land, uh, primarily the land that's owned by the port, but also other industrial land that, that needs infrastructure. Um, uh, what, what would you say are the best opportunities? What should we be pursuing in terms of the types of industries that would be a good fit for the properties that we have and the communities that we have? 
I do think that the strengths here that are in manufacturing um, should continue to be the direction. Now, having said that, um, and being in my seat of the, re the organization responsible for bringing companies into this region, you know, we're not going to see a lot of manufacturing companies or manufacturing projects just up and relocate out of California. I mean, there's, uh, for those companies that are here in the manufacturing space, you know that there's equipment, there's uh, intensive uh, property that you have there that you, you're, it's not as easy to just pick up that investment and that workforce and move it into an entirely lo different location. Um, having said that, though, I do think it, does, it depends on what the community wants you know, your future to be. I do think you can build on the existing skill sets of those manufacturing companies and translate into new and emerging technology areas um, such as clean tech, and I know that that had a rough go. I, I heard uh, Mayor Bemis kind of acknowledge that back uh, in the recession, and I came from a market as well where we had put almost all of our eggs into solar technology. Again, building on the strengths that we had from um, aerospace and defense and advanced manufacturing and semiconductors, and it just, you know, we banked on one industry and it didn't carry us well. So. I would caution uh, to be carefully um, selective, I think, in what you want to be. But I do think that there's still a great future in manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, light industrial manufacturing. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for this part of our overall region, uh, transportation is both an asset and a liability. You know, it depends exactly where you are. So the Troutdale Reynolds uh, project is, you know, you can could, you could hit it hit the interstate freeway with an nine iron. So it's right there, although getting to the freeway is still a little bit of a challenge, but we're, you know, we're all working on that. So uh, that's an enormous asset. Um, also, um, uh, the electrical infrastructure, the energy infrastructure there is, it's a tremendous asset. And I wanna take a moment to talk about energy here in a, in a second. Uh, the Williams uh, pipeline, you know, runs right under the property. This is a real nexus for uh, for energy, and the reason. Uh, and and let me just talk about one other uh, thing because these are port themes in in part. Um, the other the growth areas for us are going to be in things related to food and things related to energy, uh, and the the food is because uh, you know the world is sees this rapidly growing middle class in places like China and uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the Indian subcontinent, and they're all unable to feed themselves. I mean, they can do part of it, but they simply don't have adequate supplies of arable land. Uh, and there is a lack of confidence in China, for example, in the food supply, and with good reason. Uh, and so American produced or processed food is in great demand in these places. And I think that food processing is going to continue to be an area of great growth and an area with the transportation assets that we have here uh, that will be um, in great demand. And it should be a target and a, and a focus, in my opinion. Energy. Consider this. Uh, six years ago, uh, the Port of Portland completed a master plan for uh, Portland International Airport, which we have to do periodically to satisfy the FAA. And at that time, one of the things you have to do is forecast uh, uh, air travel, flight traffic, what's going to look like. And we were looking at fuel prices that were re really just going straight up uh, and having an immense impact on the psychology and the outlook of um, uh, the commercial aviation industry. And uh, at that time, I think fuel represented about 40% of the cost of flying a commercial airplane, roughly. Uh, and they were beginning to think, gee, it's going to get up to 60. And the psychology of the airlines in those days was all they wanted to do was be the last man standing. And then they would own the market and, you know, and find a way to survive. Uh, and over the course of the last six years, what has happened is the United States is now within a year and a half or two of being completely self-sufficient uh, in the production of transportation fuels. And it is having a radical and transforming effect, not only on commercial aviation. Uh, you know, I see our friends from, uh, from Boeing here. I mean, they're just out of space to build things. Uh, the, the order book for Boeing and for Airbus and for Embraer and, and, and uh, Bombardier and the others 
is, uh, is overwhelming. I just got back from a, a conference in Las Vegas where this was a primary topic of conversation. And the psychology of the airlines today is, hey, we're going to be here. We're going to grow. Well, take that attitude and that, uh, that, uh, that real change in psychology around energy and imagine aluminum making and steel making and steel fabrication and things that require energy, much of which has been outsourced because of the cost of energy, not so much the cost of labor. And I think it's not entirely uh, out of the question that we're going to see a return of some amount of that kind of activity as a result of stable uh, long-term energy prices. It's going to have a transforming effect. It already is having a transforming effect on our economy. And so I think things related to energy are going to have a big impact. So right now, we just announced uh, a month ago an investment by a Canadian company called Pembina. They're a pipeline company. Uh, and they, uh, they take uh, a stream of natural gas and split it into its various constituent parts. Natural gas goes off in one direction and heats our houses and, and uh, turns the turbines, but they also take ethane, butane, and propane out. And in the United States, we just don't, or actually in North America, we don't use as much propane as is being produced by this natural gas stream, so they want to export it. Uh, and so they announced a, a terminal um, development at our port. It's a half a billion dollar uh, development. It is the largest single investment in the history of the city of Portland on order of magnitude of two. Now, three or four years ago, I could not have imagined anything like this because there was a sense that we were really running out of oil. We were even more uh, dependent on all of these parts of the world that hated us. Uh, and now suddenly, that's not the case. Uh, and I, I believe strongly that this newfound strength in the production of energy um, has the potential to have a very transforming effect on our economy because this is not happening in all parts of the world. And so we can take that and produce things and sell them to people and places that don't. Uh, and it's a relatively new development, which is why I think we're, I feel like we're a little behind the, the eight ball in, in uh, appreciating what that can do for us, uh, but it's going to be substantial. So you have any big announcements for us today about people moving to Gresham or Troutdale? I have no big announcements today. Uh, <laughs> Your staff wouldn't let you anyway. Yeah, yeah. They, so, they do the big announcements. So again, looking at it from the regional perspective, I think five minutes, okay. Um, you know, we often uh, feel like there's a competition among, among the cities within the metro area. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, Gresham, East County has available land. Other parts of the metro area don't have available land. Could you talk a little bit about you know, whether that's really a competition that, that's worth fighting over, or is it, if we have more available to everybody, uh, does that sort of uh, increase our chances of bringing in additional industries? And yes, Janet, you I can mean, go first. It, it's more of the latter. I mean, certainly you start to dilute the regional model when you start to compete you know, city to city about who's got what. Um, obviously, it is you know, at the local level, something that um, our local partners, our local economic development practitioners have to be concerned about because they've got city council members and mayors to answer to. Um, however, from again, from the regional perspective, uh, it's important that we do what we can to ensure that a company that is maybe considering expanding, whether they are expanding from Gresham and are maybe looking to stay in Gresham or if they're looking to Vancouver on the other side of the river, or if they're looking at Salt Lake and Denver, it's important that we work together as a region to ensure that that company stays here uh, and if there's anything that we can do. I mean, I think this, the whole Triquint, um, I'll take it out of East County for a second, but the, the Triquint and the RFMD merger, the Corvo uh, new company that, that is developing is certainly something that we are working with our partners in Hillsboro and at the state to ensure that that company feels valued they understand that we want them here um, because surely um, North Carolina is going to make a play to bring that headquarter operations here. And so the more I think that companies understand that they 
um, have a support system, whatever that means to them, whether that's um, fixing a curb, I mean, if it's the workforce, if it's the supply chain that surrounds them, whatever we can do to ensure that we're making the case for that company staying here, I think is, is going to be our contribution uh, to regional economic development. Yeah, I think uh, that that gets overplayed a little bit. I know that uh, from time to time, people in certain parts of the region feel like they're not competing successfully with other parts of the region. But, you know, let's be real here. Nobody's going to build a facility in western Washington County that needs access to the freeway because there isn't any. I mean, it's really a very challenging. It's the number one complaint we get from our friends at Intel, how long it takes them to get their uh, products for export out to the airport or around the airport. And we're, we're all working on it and, you know, trying to improve things, but it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say the same for, uh, for gas infrastructure, for example, or for, uh, for electrical infrastructure. It's just very limited out there. Now, there are things they have that, that's great. Uh, nobody's going to go to Clackamas County for a large lot industrial development because there isn't any. Uh, so, I mean, I think you have to just uh, focus on the assets that you have and then think about um, who is likely to be attracted to that. and, and uh, the, the businesses that are growing and expanding or moving here, for example, they get all that. I mean, they'll, they'll move into a region, take a look, figure out what the assets are, what connects with them, what they need, and that's where they're going to go. They're not uh, typically able any longer to uh, uh, pull up three parcels in a region and then get into a bidding war with various uh, parts of the region because there just isn't enough of that anymore. Okay. Well, thank you both for, for participating today. We really appreciate you taking the time to do that.